Westminster, the former Home Secretary Amber Rudd, Yasmin Alibaya Brown, the broadcaster and writer, and the director of Conservative Friends in Afghanistan, Shabnam Nasimi. If you'd like to ask a question to our panel, it's very simple. You just pick up the phone. 0345 6060 973 is what you need to dial. And of course, you can watch us as well. We're on Global Player, on the LBC YouTube channel, Facebook, and Twitter feeds. Call 0345 6060 973. Tweet at LBC. Text 84850. Cross question with Ian Dale. This is LBC. And as you can see, if you're watching us, all the guests are in the studio, which is the first time that this studio has had four guests in it. So I'm very excited by this. Um, we're not that, that too close, are we, Yasmin? Or, I can see you leaning away al <laughs> already. <laughs> Charles, if you lean away, I have to lean towards Amber. <laughs> we're all very excited. We are. All right, let's, let's crack on with our first question. It's from John in Oxford. Hello, John. Hello, good evening to you all. Um, I'd like to know whether the panel agree with raising contributions to pay for service. A yes or no will do. And if it's no, <laughs> what tax would they put up in order to pay for it? Now, you slightly broke up there, but what, what, you, what the question is, does the panel agree with putting up national insurance contributions? And if not, what alternative tax do they propose? Now, this argument has been raging for, well, more than 10 years now. Um, Amber, it's, it's really ever since you've been in Parliament and before, isn't it? Well, yeah, how, yeah, how would you, you pay for it? For that. No, I'm not. It's one of the few things I'm not okay, blaming good. you for. We'll get to that, for sure. <laughs> um, so my answer would be, um, I think it's good thing to finally grip this and say we've got to raise the money to do it. My God, we've waited a long time for this. But the answer is, having looked at all the debates and heard people commenting on it, I think that national insurance is a poor place to place it. I would have put up a pe I w I, if you're going to put on national insurance you've got to put national insurance on pensioners as well because I know plenty of wealthy people aged over 65, 66 who are just not obviously paying according to the law national insurance now and I just think that's wrong. I think we're going Why to... Why is that? I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's an a anomaly, of, isn't it? It is. It is an anomaly and uh, it's when national insurance was part of your insurance which you needed when you retired so when you retired you wouldn't pay it anymore but now national insurance is well known as just being part of the whole tax take it's it's ridiculous not having part of the tax take for people who are still earning aged over 66 i think what is difficult here are the politics of it and as is so often the case with politicians they know what to do they just don't know how to get re-elected after they've done it <laughs> But this could be a perfect storm for the Conservatives, couldn't it? Because it's not just this. Uh, it's rumoured that later on this week the triple lock will be broken. Um, and and th there's another thing which I now can't remember, but it, it could be the Conservative version of the Lib Dem student tuition fees promise, couldn't it? It's a very difficult one. I think that what the Conservatives are holding on to, and a lot of actually the commentators are repeating, all bets are off since we had the pandemic, therefore things are changed. But I don't think the public will feel like that for very long. I don't think that they will want national insurance hitting the workers, as it were, and the poor is paid. So I mm. think they've got to think again how it's distributed. So if, as the questioner says, if not NI, what? Then I think that you can accept NI if potentially if it's on pensioners as well. But if not, you raise taxes. That's what this is. This is just okay. a straightforward tax raise. Yasmin. I am one of those people who's over the vastly over the age of uh, retirement. Would you be happy to pay an eye on the, very on the happy enormous to pay. fee that you get for appearing on this program? <laughs> I would be very happy to pay my share of NI. I would be very happy not to get free travel. I think we have we we have been a very lucky generation. A couple but that's of not very well for you to say because you are comparatively no, well off I, compared I, to other people. I'm, so I'm saying from where I say I'm not rich. We're not rich. You know, we're we are I've fine. I've been to your house. No, well, <laughs> well, it's a flat. I bought it for twenty thousand pounds, and it is a flat. Um, it's 78, 1978. But I do think that. It needs to be. Um, it needs to go towards taxation, and I agree completely with with what Amber has said about you know NI being unfairly loaded on the young and the and the poorest, and it's just wrong. I own my flat, and I should be paying much more. Okay, Shabnam, from a, from a younger person's point of view, for those watching, they can see that you're younger than the rest of our panel, but I won't ask you how young. But I mean, I do think this is a generational issue that people who are older have a rather different view from younger generations. Um, look, I think the social care sector has definitely 
been battered enough for the last 18 months. And um, we, I've recently read a statistic that one in 10 uh, of those in the care population um, have succumbed to the virus. So it's time, high, m very important that we, we address this. It's been underfunded for a very long time. In terms of the getting um, uh, funding it through national insurance tax, it's not fair on the working age population. Um, there are many alternatives where we can fix this problem. One, I, my personal opinion is the um, is a sort of state style pension system where uh, we can offer the basic care, uh, we can fund the basic care for the elderly, but um, those like Amber mentioned who are well, well off cannot then um, apply for insurance to add to that standard care. Um, there are alternatives, but I think the national insurance is, is unfair on the working population and, and the working population have unfortunately um, lost um, employment over the last 18 months. Um, it's going to be a very difficult economy for them. But the working population has got to pay for it one way or another. The, the non-working population can't pay for it. So if the working population doesn't pay for it, who does? Well, like I said, I think that the, my, my suggestion would be adopting a state uh, pension system where we offer and fund the basic uh, care, but the, okay. the, the rest comes from, from the pockets of the people that are asking for that extra I think we support. also have to look at the, not just income and employment, but wealth. I think we, we're going to have to grapple with that. I know as uh, politically it's a nightmare, but I really do think that, you know, this assumption that we who have homes, especially in the South, which are worth so much more than they are everywhere else, can hang on to it and pass it on and, and, and have the free care that everybody else has. We've got to get more means tested now on this. Ian Blackford, obviously, it's the same situation in, in Scotland. And presumably, Scotland would have to adopt whatever system the UK government decides here. Or is it... I mean, Social Security is partly devolved, but not fully, is it? Yeah, indeed. So there's all the, the unintended consequences. And that's an important point. And firstly, actually, I don't believe this is the right way to do it because national insurance is not a progressive tax. And mm. just well, as it's the, actually as quite the regressive. Others, it's it? regressive. So it's not the right way to do it. Of course, people pay national insurance before they pay tax. So this is a tax yeah. on, on lower earners in particular. And as has rightly been said, those above pension will age are not making a contribution to this. So you could end up in retirement with a, an income of £50,000 but actually pay no contribution towards this. And it's not right. And that intergenerational point is, is, is one that's really important. You think about what's changed over the course of the last couple of decades. You think about tuition fees. You think about the increase in house prices. We're, we're lobbing on difficulties for young people to be able to, to find their way in life. And we really need to think that through. So national insurance, this should just be killed stone dead. Of course, we need to make sure that we fund public services properly. But the, the rub to your question, Ian, is that if national insurance is applied, it will apply it right across the United Kingdom. But this is to fix a problem in England and, and Wales. Um, so Scottish people, in effect, would be paying a poll tax in order to deal with an English problem, whereas if it was income tax, we would be able to take our own actions in Scotland. And keep in mind that we already have free personal care. So some of this we've... Free we've, personal care, how different is that to what we would term social care? Um, well, in, in England, you, there are still charges that apply if you're having that level of care at home. In Scotland, it doesn't apply. So some of this is done. I'm not saying that we're not perfect. And there is a review going on to the care sector as well. And I think the point that, that was made, we need to make sure that the sector is funded properly. We need to make sure that people are paid appropriately so that we can attract staff. And we need to have high quality care for those that need it. So let me just get this straight. If Boris Johnson announces tomorrow, or whoever it is that is going to announce it, uh, that there's going to be a rise in national insurance for UK-wide employers and employees, you're saying that the money that, 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 is raised, that is raised in Scotland from that actually won't be used for Scottish social care because you already provide it free anyway. Well, we provide social care. Um, I mean, obviously, there, there would be an argument that there be there should be some element of Barnet consequentials, but we need to yeah. see what's in the detail. But also, remember, there's another point to this, which, which is key as well, because we don't know at this stage if there will be employer contributions uh, for national insurance as well, and that will be an additional tax on jobs. So let's wait and see what's proposed. But I think broadly aligned with the consensus, far better to look at income tax as a way of raising funds in a progressive way and funds which are fair to everybody in society. But Amber, this would obviously be a, a breach of a manifesto promise, but well, whichever yeah. way they go, and that's quite a difficult one, isn't it? Because although, I mean, manifestos are not sort of sacrosanct, you, you obviously, depending on events, sometimes have to tweak things at the edge, but this would be a blatant break. 
Yeah, it would. Um, uh, however, there is a slight conflict, isn't there, with another manifesto pledge, which is to fix social care. So B Boris has made both pledges, and I think they're difficult to keep. It's difficult to keep both. Mm. But he's. I think he's entered into this discussion, and he's going to make a proposal. It sounds like it's going to be on national insurance. I expect there will be a step back from that, where either national insurance is added to pensioners, which is quite a big deal, um, again, the Conservative voter base, of course, or it'll go back to being on tax. I mean, the issue, I think, with Yasmin's proposal about looking at a wealth tax is I can see the long grass happening again. That is a way too big a subject to happen in the middle of a parliament. I mean, it, this is a breach of the manifesto commitment, but a wealth tax, um, that would be just a huge breach. But in terms of the parliamentary arithmetic here, there seem to me to be many, many Conservative MPs who do not agree with national insurance. And there were all these stories at the weekend about a reshuffle on Thursday. I don't think there will be a reshuffle on Thursday because it, it was a whips method of saying you better all stay in line because there might be a reshuffle and you wouldn't want to step out of line, would you? What are you, I mean, you, OK, you've only been in Parliament today, but have you picked up any hints about what a, what a Tory rebellion might look like? Yeah, but we've heard this so many times since the election of 2019 that there was going to be a Tory rebellion on whatever it will be. There's a majority of 80. I don't doubt that there will be a number of Conservative MPs that will rebel. Do I believe that that could be significant enough that it stops this going through? Well, to use a fine Scots expression, I hate my doots. And, <laughs> and the other thing, I think you were when you were asking earlier, Ian, about the other issues that were there, the other big issue is universal credit. And, yeah. and what happens that? was that. my third one. Um, I was trying to help you out. <laughs> yeah. um, because, because that's a massive issue and that's going yeah. to affect millions of people. Uh, and this is a thing, Yasmin, when they talk about levelling up, which I think probably everyone would agree with that aspiration, but if you cut £20 a week from those who are poorest, even if they're the working poor, what does that say about levelling up? It says that they said what they wanted to say in order to win the elections, but they didn't mean it. And that's the thing. Either you mean what you say, because these are 20 quid is a huge amount of money for a lot of families. You know, if you look but at the that, 20, the food that, poverty. That £20 was introduced during uh, pandemic. Corona, during the pan pandemic. I, I don't think we should encourage state dependency. I think it's more about how levelling up, it's also about how we ensure that people get into employment, how we uh, introduce our But a lot of the people and, getting this extra £20, are they in are in employment. I think oh, no, 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 absolutely. It's, it's 40% it, it's of It's actually the, for the, wor wor the working yeah. poor are affected by this as well. Well, that's, I mean, it's going to end sometime, just like furlough scheme is going to. Well, we that, can't but rely that's, that's, on the government. But that, that is the government's issue. position, is that it's a, it's part, it's like the furlough scheme. Yeah. It was an addition, additional uh, payment into universal credit in order to help people during the pandemic. The trouble with that approach is that it's difficult to take money away from exactly. people. So it's, I would, I mean, I, it's easy for me to say, I'm not in the treasury. Uh, I would say, Keep the twenty quid. <laughs> Long time ago, <laughs> I remember. Um, it, it, keep the twenty quid because it is just too difficult to take it away. Yeah. You didn't, but having made the case for it during the pandemic, I just think it'd be too difficult to take but it away. It caused huge a hardship. Of, a lot of people have lost some of their work, the number of hours that they're working, and actually forty percent of those people on that. Uh, receiving that money are working all hours. Some some of them three jobs. Okay, so I think. Yeah, um, you know, again, I agree with Amber a lot at the moment. <laughs> I'm not, not in government Amber. anymore. Um, <laughs> we let them keep that money. Otherwise, it will feel like the deepest and most horriblest cynicism. It, it will, but also what you have to consider, I visited the food bank in Glasgow three weeks ago, and the fact that that additional help had been there has meant that many people have not had to visit the, the food banks on a regular basis. Other mm. uh, cohorts in society have done. If we take this away at a time that food prices are rising and that fuel bills are rising, it's going to be a perfect storm. And it does mean that people are going to have to make that choice as to whether or not they're feeding their family or, or heating their home. It would be mean-spirited, and I would appeal to parliamentarians across the the, the chamber to reflect very carefully on this. We shouldn't be doing this. Okay. Well, it's great to have you all back in the studio because you're all interacting with each other. When you're on the video wall over there, yeah. it's much more difficult to do that. So it's fantastic. We'll kind of come to another question in just a moment. 0345 6060 973. If you'd like to talk to Amber Rudd, Yasmin Alibi Brown, Ian Blackford, and Shabnam Nasimi, it's 816. This is LBC.
Ask Question with Ian Dale on LBC. 20 past eight on LBC. Uh, Stephen on the Isle of Dogs says, I used to live on the Isle of Dogs. We used to call it the Canine Islands in those days. Um, he says, Ian, nearly everyone on the panel has agreed income tax is probably a better way to do this. Why won't the government see sense? Well, we'll find out tomorrow when they explain their position, I guess. 0345 606 if you'd like to ask our panel a question. We have Amber Rudd, Yasmin Alibaya Brown, Ian Blackford and Shabnam Nasimi with us. James in Ayrshire has a crucial question. James, what is it? Hi. Hi. Good, ev good ev evening, Ian, and good evening, panel. My question is, what exactly was achieved by the presence of the United Kingdom in Afghanistan? We could be here all night on that one, couldn't we? Um, Yasmin Albaya Brown, I asked you during the break, did you support the invasion of Afghanistan? And you rather surprised one of our fellow panellists by saying yes. Is it, I mean, look, looking at the question, what has been achieved, we have to think why it was started in the first place, yes. don't we? Yes, and I, I, I mean, I, I remember the day before 9-11 writing a column in The Independent where I was a columnist saying, why are we letting Taliban do what they're doing to uh, girls and women and why are we doing business with them and why is the US and UK business uh, uh, kind of bosses out there doing business with them. Then 9-11 happened and I guess because I was kind of pre-thinking this, I thought this was very important because they were destroying. They were destroying people, not just not women, girls and others. Looking back on it, I think it would be a total mistake to say the whole thing was wrong because in the 20 years, the progress made by females has been astonishing, thanks to the NGO sector mainly. The problem is they never knew what they were there for, never knew what the plan was, never knew what they were going to do with the nation. Um, and one of the most depressing things I've discovered only in the last week is that more uh, ordinary civilians were killed by drones sent by Obama than ever were by George Bush. I find that so appalling. Mm. You heard it first here. Always rely on you. <laughs> um, Shabnam. You come from Afghanistan originally. You came here in 1999, I think I think you said. I mean, it must have been the most emotional month of, of your life over the last month, watching what's been happening. And I don't know if you felt helpless or... I mean, I know you were able to help some people, but just take us through sort of what you've been feeling over the last month and then, then we'll go to answer James's question. I think I'd probably be here until <laughs> tomorrow if I um, discuss all the aspects of this. But first of all, just in terms of the fact that um, Yasmin mentioned that we were there without plan. Look, the West was in Afghanistan for 20 years and we have such high expectations for a country where when you went in, you were starting with a blank canvas. There was no infrastructure, no institution, no system. And you expected after 20 years to stand on its own two feet and fight on its own. It's not going to happen. The West wasn't created in 20 years and the developing world. So that's one argument I disagree with. It, 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 it takes endurance and time and perseverance. Second of all, the fact that your caller raised this question also shows a failure in terms of the British government for not showcasing our achievements over the last 20 years and engaging the British public to support the intervention. A lot of the people over the last two weeks that I've been speaking to, particularly the ones that are outside of my political circle, are saying, well, what are we doing all the way there? It has nothing to do with us. And, and, and the fact that so many are uninformed about the Afghan, Afghan, Afghan war just shows that people were not informed or engaged with and consulted with over the last 20 years and i'm talking about the british public to be able to show that after 20 years huge progress was made i traveled to afghanistan multiple times starting in 2004 and in the first few years it was difficult i mean it took a lot of sacrifices lives were lost and um, both civilians and british forces but if you move on towards sort of the last nine, eight years, you probably have seen that we actually haven't reported any British soldiers being killed in Afghanistan. That shows that, yes, it was difficult at the beginning, but we reached a point where British forces were there in a non-combat role. They weren't fighting. You were there simply to provide the training, the morale, the equipment and the funding. And if we continue to do so, 
we, we were training 400,000 Afghan forces. That's a huge number. And if we continue to stay there, support them, they would be able to fight on their own and protect Afghanistan. It just, I think we, we, we fail to understand that Afghanistan needed much, much longer to reach to a point where it could stand on its own two feet. And I think the final point it would be that the fact that we also don't understand that Afghan, the Afghan crisis or the Afghan war is not just a, a national problem for them. It's a regional and a gro- global problem. The fact that we went to Afghanistan in 2001 showed that sec- the, the stability in that country ensures stability elsewhere. So we were there for our own national interests as well here in the UK uh, and Western security. So you know, it, it, there's lots of parts to this where people are not connecting the dots. And that's why people are asking, well, I'm glad it's ended. Why were we there? Why, why, why were we there in the first place? And we were all told, well, the, the intelligence didn't predict that the Taliban could get into get to Kabul so quickly. Do you buy that? I don't know what you were hearing um, over the past few months, but um, whether whether you thought that this was a possi- this outcome was a possibility. Well, we saw that you know the Afghan forces weren't really fighting, and there's a lot that we still we don't really understand in terms of why Afghans weren't resisting and fighting as much as they should have been. And I'm hearing a lot of information in terms of the fact that the former Afghan government Ash- under Ashraf Ghani and, and uh, the US um, ambassador El- Elvoy, uh, envoy uh, for Afghanistan, Khalil Zad, were saying that, you know, they were encouraging Afghan military not to fight against the Taliban. So there's a lot of speculations to what actually happened. But um, I, don't, I, I mean, I didn't think that Kabul would fall within a matter of days. It just felt like you, we handed Afghanistan to the Taliban on a silver platter. There was no resistance, although resistance is now beginning. I mean, in the Panjshir Valley, as we've seen uh, over the last couple of days, it's been honestly really devastating to see how much lives have been lost just in the last couple of days. It's it's, it's hard. It's heartbreaking. Um, Obviously, I stayed with Shabnam for quite some time, so I'd be grateful if you two could keep your remarks relatively brief because we do have to go to the news in three minutes. Um, Ian Blackford. Yeah, firstly, I don't believe there was a failure of intelligence. I think that we had (laughs) security personnel right across Afghanistan for a long period of time. We had good links right through the country. If there has been a failure, and there has been, it's been one of assessment. It's not been about intelligence, and I have to be very careful about not criticising our intelligence personnel who've done a first-class job. I am just so ashamed... And I think, I mean, I would congratulate Shabnam for what she said here because we didn't need to do this. We have walked away from Afghanistan and left millions of women and children to their plight with the Taliban and left behind a number of UK citizens and those that we bear a responsibility for. And I think there have been UK government ministers that have stepped up to the plate over the last couple of weeks. Ben Wallace, I think, has done his best. Kevin Forster in the Home Office. But the lack of preparation by the Foreign Office when they knew this was coming down the line for 18 months, is shameful, utterly shameful. Do you think, Amber, that th- this is something where the West in general, we've, we've all taken our eye off the ball? I mean, it, it, we, we can all look in hindsight, but I don't remember anybody warning when Trump made that agreement with the Taliban in Doha. I don't remember anybody sort of saying, um, hang on a minute, do you not realise what will happen here? It's very easy to blame, just blame those in power at the moment. But hindsight is a wonderful thing. No, I agree with that. It does feel like people took their eye off the ball. Can I just address James's question, which is sort of what was the point of those 20 years? What was the impact? And it's very clear to me that those 20 years, we were safer as a country, as a world, really, than we were before those 20 years, when Al-Qaeda had their training camps in Afghanistan, and that was a failure of intelligence. Mm -hmm. People weren't aware that was taking place. During those 20 years, those training camps did not take place. We had eyes on the ground, we worked with the government, and Al-Qaeda did not have a home in Afghanistan. So we should be in no doubt that during those 20 years, the world was a safer place because of the intervention that tried to build in Afghanistan, tried to help women and children, tried to make a more sort of cohesive society. But at the core of it, we made the world safer because Al-Qaeda did not have their training camps there. And that's what worries me going forward. But I do want to say one thing, that the number of civilians that died didn't feel safe at all. Entire wedding parties were wiped out. And that was mainly the Americans. And they were barely in our newspapers. And that left uh, an anger, I think, that may be partly behind not resisting. You know, it's very complicated, exactly as you've said. 3,000 people, of course, were killed in the uh, World Trade Center. Yeah, but many more. 
civilians, well, let's non-combatants. Well, lives against each other. All yeah. lost blood. Um, Shabnam, final question for you uh, on, on this subject. What role has Pakistan played in all of this? Because I think, in a way, that's one of the unspoken stories here, and that Pakistan was at least in par- partially responsible for the creation of the Taliban. They provided um, succor to them, they provided funds to them, and indeed provide, provided a refuge for some of al-Qaeda uh, in, in the country. Uh, and yet they're supposed to be one of our main allies. It's a good point that you've mentioned, actually, considering the fact that yesterday in Panjshir Valley, people were accusing Pakistan of of helping the Taliban um, attack the the province with the drones. Um, I think we haven't um, addressed Afghanistan with with Pakistan as much as much as we should have. Um, that conversation, as far as I know, c- continues to just be, be ignored. Um, at, Pakistan, like you said, provides safe havens, has provided safe havens for the Taliban for the last 20 years. The fact that the Taliban were able to uh, regroup, retrain um, and and enter Afghanistan much stronger um, just shows the role that Pakistan plays. And they've never called out um, openly, uh, they're, they're um, criticizing the Taliban. They've they've never spoken about it. And the fact that there's like now, I think there's about 30, 40 million population of um, Pashtuns in, in Pakistan, which considerably make up the Taliban as well. Um, it plays a huge role. And the fact that Britain is not having that conversation with Pakistan is also um, disappointing. Okay, James, thank you very much for your question. More questions after the news. It's 8.31, and here's Serena Farrow with the headlines. The NHS in England will receive an extra £5.4 billion over the next six months. The government says the funding will help hospitals respond to coronavirus and deal with the backlog caused by the pandemic. Boris Johnson's defended the UK's evacuation from Afghanistan after Labour accused them of being too slow. The Prime Minister says we can be proud of the legacy our troops left behind and has promised to spend millions supporting veterans. And as a warning, the shortage of workers affecting supply chains across Britain could last up to two years. The CBI business body says the government now needs to take urgent actions such as being more flexible on immigration policies. The weather cloudy with light rain and drizzle tonight particularly in the west of Scotland and Northern Isles, a low of 10 degrees. This is LBC.
Questions Conversation. Cross Question with Ian Dale. Tweet at LBC. 8.35 on LBC. Let me reintroduce my panel. Amber Rudd, former Home Secretary, is here. Yasmin Alibaya-Brown, broadcaster and columnist. Where can people read you at the moment, Yasmin? Mm. Where can people read you at the moment? I hope so. Uh, where? Uh, I'm, oh, where can? Plug, I thought you said where can people read you? <laughs> oh, the I newspaper. Excellent. Every week. Um, Ian Blackford is Westminster leader of the SMP and Shabnam Nasimi is director of the Conservative Friends of Afghanistan. If you've never watched us before, we've got everybody in the studio tonight. It's given a fresh impetus to the show, I think. Uh, you can do so on Global Player or on the LBC YouTube channel, website, lbc.co.uk, Facebook and Twitter feeds. Right, next question from Alex in Watford. Alex, hi, go ahead. Good evening, Ian. Good evening, panel. After I've asked my question to the panel, could I say something to Ian Blackford, please, Ian? Oh, it depends what it is, but go on. <laughs> OK. <laughs> only if it, only right. if it's nice. <laughs> OK. Uh, Mr Blackford, or Ian Blackford, I believe Nicholas Sturgeon, this generation's Margaret Thatcher, are the best. Ooh. Well, is that a good thing? My goodness, um, I've never had anyone put it quite like that. But when she's a, she's a very dear friend of mine, and, and 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 of course my leader, I think she's inspirational, and I think people see that on on a wider. Can I, can I just give you a word of warning that when I interviewed Alex Salmond in two thousand and eight, he made some positive comments about Margaret Thatcher, and it dominated the Scottish media for the next three days. I remember. I'd quit while you were. I remember. Ahead if I yeah, but look, she's a very fine woman, and one that I hope continues to lead us lead us to, to independence, if I may say so as well. well so thank you for your comments. The front page Alex. there, Ian. <laughs> right, what's your question, Alex? Right, what action should the government to take to tackle the shortage of lorry drivers in the country? Amber Rudd. Well, when I was Home Secretary, when we had a shortage of doctors in the country, for instance, you uh, adjust the rules so that you make sure that you can have more coming in to respond to the need. Um, so that's what I would suggest. They make some sort of adjustment to respond to the obviously gl glaring need to have more lorry drivers. Because I think probably, Ian, that reintroducing freedom of movement is out of the question. <laughs> so I'm not going to be foolish enough to suggest that. I'll leave that to Ian. Uh, but I think they should probably adjust by making sure that lorry drivers are allowed to come in with a lower threshold of salary than currently allowed for people coming in to work in the UK from the European Union. Um, I can't see what else they can do, but it sounds to me like they're not going to do that, that they're going to dig in and say, let the market adjust, let the market put up salaries, let the market train more people. But in the meantime, there's going to be emptier and emptier shelves. What I find quite interesting, actually, is that previously I'd have thought that if there were empty shelves of people's favourite jammy dodgers or cocoa pops or whatever it is, is that people would object. People seem to not be reminding too much. The consumer themselves is just adjusting and, and making different um, purchases. But the businesses themselves, they are really screaming for help. And that's where I think this government is, is, is showing itself to be weak. It's not focusing enough on how to help businesses really succeed. Do and you, this particular element is a problem. Do you put the shortage down to Brexit? Well, it's partially down to Brexit, at the very least. I mean, even the Daily Mail I saw the other day was saying it's partially, not all, not all due to Brexit. Because Germany has the same problem, doesn't it? Not on our scale. It has about 80,000. They, they are, they, yes, we are 100,000 short. Germany's also short. Yes, apparently nearly 80,000, I agree. So there is an issue. But we know that lorry drivers who came to the UK, a lot of them did come from the European Union, and they can't anymore. So I don't want you to think that I'm pinning it entirely on No, I'm, I'm, I'm just far a bit from me. <laughs> it's just partially because of it. And basically, it's like any market. If you want to make sure that you get more, you open the sluice gates to get more. Ian, how is the shortage of lorry drivers affecting Scotland? Particularly because you, you represent a very, very remote constituency, don't you? So you, your constituents might be affected more than most. Well, they are, I'm afraid to say, because let, let's take the air of sky where I live. We only have one supermarket operator, which is the co-op. So if the co-op runs out, mm. you have nowhere else to go. And I'm, I'm really delighted we're talking about this because it's so important. I don't think the, the media in general has focused on this as much as we need to. Four weeks ago in the sky, there was no milk delivery to the co-op. That meant there was wow. no milk on the island. And, of course, the beginning of this was right back at the, the, the start after we how, left. How many EU, people live on Sky? About 11,000. Right. Because we obviously export a lot of products, a lot of shellfish, for example, and it's been a disaster. I had businessmen that were in tears because of what they were going to have to go through. We have killed our export of live shellfish. And it's not just the fact that, I mean, you think about the 25,000 lorry drivers that have gone back to the EU, that's part of, you're right, it's multifaceted. But this has been a massive problem. And I, I worry about what's going to happen in, in the run up to Christmas. 
uh, because that's when the shortage is really And the really problem is that this. there is no short-term solution, is there? Because you can't just... I mean, I couldn't go down to my local Sainsbury's and say, I'd like to be a lorry driver for you, because I'd presumably then have to take months training and then I'd have to pass a test. If I may say so, I miss Amber from the comments, and she's just given the answer, a partial answer, to what the Conservative government should be doing, because when you have a, when you have a situation like this, you have to adjust. Yeah. You have to come up with a solution, and Amber's given that's, that's a, a partial answer. I mean, I would have free movement of people because we benefited from it I see, I enormously. Knew say that. Well, but, but, it, but it's true because, well, look, I've got hospitality businesses that can't open seven days a week because they can't find enough labour. We don't have unemployment in a meaningful yeah, scale. But they might in, be able the to find the labour if they'd pay them a decent wage. And that was well, part of the whole Brexit thing, wasn't it? That, that, we, that lots of businesses, and I'm not, I mean, there were lots of smaller businesses, genuinely couldn't survive if they weren't just paying minimum wage. But there were huge amounts of big businesses that were using cheap labour as sort of, ex they were exploiting so, cheap labour. To, to an extent, that's true. But, I, I mean, there are businesses in the West Highlands that are paying decent salaries, but simply the labour pool is not there. But th the answer to the question you raise, Ian, is to make sure that we have the investment in the economy that drives up productivity, that drives up living standards. And you need to have a cohesive approach to this, and that's what's been missing. And the whole point about this is that European workers have been the scapegoat for, for, for many people. I'm not trying to reopen the Brexit debate, but Amber will remember, I mean, speech after speech in the House of Commons, we warned that this is what would happen as as a consequence of not having that... Do, that, that do you not think, though, there. that lorry drivers have gone home also in part due to COVID? I mean, when there's an emergency, you, you naturally, psychologically gravitate home, don't you? It's, that's why I said it's multifaceted, yeah. but, but, but Brexit is at the core of a lot of the problems that we're now facing. Okay. Our export industries are really paying a price. We are the only country that's seen a decline in exports over the course of the, the last year. There's no other European nation that has because the bureaucracy, the costs of doing so are now too large. So we're losing business. We're losing job opportunities as a consequence of that. And people are not being able to, to get the products that they need in the supermarket. Shabnam, have you noticed empty shelves in your local supermarket? Thankfully, not yet. And I'm not as informed as Amber and Ian on this subject, but I'll, I'll just sort of give my two cents. Um, I think... We've relied on the EU quite heavily when it comes to our labour. And I think this is probably now timely for us to discuss and look at how we're going to be able to upskill our own population to reach uh, and, and, and fit that gap. And I think with training um, lorry drivers and, and f um, filling that, uh, that sort of reduction, potentially even getting people who are on the welfare system um, who are claiming benefits to you know, that could be a solution where we, we offer training to become lorry drivers as uh, an option for them to get into employment. Um, actually, uh, sort of a family friend um, that I, I've, uh, a neighbour of ours, when I used to live in Lewisham, used to be on on, on benefits for about 15, 20 years. Um, when the uh, the job centre was able to provide him some support to become a security at a local uh, um, uh, um, uh, tube station, he took that up went on and took that training and then became a security um, officer. And he, I mean, honestly, the he was so happy because, of course, getting out of the house uh, and finding a job was something that he, he'd never thought was possible. But there is definitely a huge... Um, uh, uh, a group of people that we can tap into it's just having a more concerted coordinated plan where we can get those who are looking for jobs to take um, take up uh, lorry driving as an option Yasmin how's your local waitrose uh, I haven't been in there for a little while. I go to Morrison's, Do actually. <laughs> I'm a Morrison's I'd woman. never have guessed. <laughs> so there. Um, but I think I, I so agree with Ian that, you know, the scapegoating of EU workers, which is one of the most disgraceful things, not just EU workers, all migrants, yeah, who have through centuries contributed to, to the growth of this country. Now, people talk about them, you know, being kind of responsible for taking low wages. One of the things is, that, you know, there are very few at the moment, and I think this will change, and I hope it does, very few British workers who would work for that amount of money. All right. And I can't see big businesses doubling. Well, some, some of the yeah, lorry drivers yeah. are getting so, massively more money. They are. And They're that's well good. I think anything that changes lives is good. But I do also think that all those people who said, I remember this so well during the Brexit debates, the, oh, it'll be like the Blitz. If they, we, they could do it, then we can do it now. Well, well let's watch and let's see. Well, who said I mean, that? 
Who oh, said lots that? of people said we've got, that. It was all got a over the, the blitz spirit. That we don't have the enough. Blitz spirit. We don't have enough butchers. We don't have enough people in the slaughterhouses. <laughs> can, can I, can I just? Pigs are going to have to be slaughtered. That won't end up on consumers' plates. It's 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 a horrendous situation. Can, can I just agree with something that Shabna said, which is that the, the, the pay and conditions is what will attract people in the end. And I don't think the government is going to take any action in answer to the question, but I think that the market will adjust. The prices will go up, the pay and conditions will improve all round, and the conditions is just as important because you hear some mm. of the stories and they're pretty horrific. So I think the market will have to adjust to try and get us more lorry drivers, and that will be a good thing. And the food will be more expensive. Yes, it'll we'll be inflationary. Be yeah, but we've had cheap food for so long, yeah, haven't yeah, we? But and, and in I, the are end, the, the market will... for all of that? Well, we'll soon see. Unless you're on, unless you're on universal credit... Is and Boris going, going to be blamed going. for an increase in sausage prices? We I haven't myself. blamed Boris once. I missed this trick. <laughs> We'll see what the next question is, shall we? Let me just tell you who's on cross-question tomorrow. We have the Shadow Home Secretary, Nick Thomas-Simmons. We have Claire Fox from the Institute of Ideas, or is it the Academy of... I never remember what the latest title is now. Um, the YouTuber, Maya Tusi, and Dr Phil Hammond. It's 8.46. This is LBC. question with Ian Dale on LBC. Call 0345 6060 973. 8.49 on LBC. You're listening and watching Cross Quest. You're listening to and watching Cross Question. Next caller is Luke in Bromley. Hello, Luke. Good evening. Hi. My question Hello. is, when we look at the disaster that France has become, how, when will the British government realise just how detrimental introducing the British, uh, so the vaccine passport will be? Well, let's go to the representative of the country that's introducing them, Ian Blackford. Well, indeed, there'll be a debate in the Scottish Parliament this week. I expect it to go through. Look, we're not out of this crisis. I, I think we should congratulate everyone that has 
done so well to get us to the point we have all those that work in the NHS, those that have come forward for vaccines. But we really need to encourage the take up, particularly amongst young people, to increase. I think the fact that we know that we've seen a marked increase in the virus over the course of the last few weeks in Scotland really does say to us that we've got to continue to take care, we've got to take precautions. But why does that involve vaccine passports? As Luke said, in France it hasn't been a tremendous success, has it? I think there's been issues in France, let's be honest about that. But one of the things when you questioned earlier about Nicola Sturgeon, there is relatively high levels of trust in the Scottish Government. I think one of the things the Scottish Government has done well is communication over the course of the last 15 months. Mm -hmm. trying to take the people with us and this is an important part of that strategy um, yeah look I, I I understand that there are a small number of people that are opposed to this but we've got to continue to make the right decisions on public health grounds to keep people safe and I think vaccine passports where you have large groups of people coming together Ian let's be honest we know that where there have been large gatherings over the course of the last few weeks they have become super spreader events well ban the events we then I mean, surely but, that's, but then you're back the but then you're back in, but then you're you're back into putting restrictions on people and having elements of lockdown and if we have to have elements of lockdown of course both governments whether it's in London or Edinburgh will mm. do that but none of us want to do that so if we can take other measures that can protect the population that keep us in a position of relative safety then it's the right thing to do. And you presumably then think that the English government should be doing this as well? Well I, I, I think that will happen um, but it is going to happen here as well. Um, I think perhaps that I'm Try not to be political. The, the communication from from number ten from the government here has not been as cohesive as it as it as it could have been. And I mean, I, I, I mean, I look around. Trying so, not to be so, political. So I don't but, need to bang yeah, it on the back. If if I coming down here. When you look around, when you're on the tube, you're on trains or whatever, um, you can see that mask wearing has has begun to break down. Yes. If I look at public transport, and of course in Scotland it's still in the law uh, that in indoor places that you have to continue to wear masks, then the adherence to that is actually very, very high. So there is a difference in public behaviour that you see here from the public behaviour that we see you're Scotland. being so reasonable on the show today. I'm trying my best. You're doing very well. Just, just if I may, just actually the, the recent large events that have taken place that have tracked whether people have caught the COVID virus out there from it have actually been very positive. That people's behaviour has changed, that people are much more cautious about it and that it, it feels like the evidence from those large events are that we don't need to have vaccines. And I do think that it'll be interesting to see what goes on in Scotland and we can see how well it goes or doesn't and then sort of, you know, we can adjust what we think about it here but I think that it'd be so much better if we can operate without them. Yasmin? I'd go for them for exactly the reasons that Ian said. Um, I mean I came on the tube today it was appalling I had to keep shifting moving my seat because uh, you know so many people are not wearing masks and I find it quite hard to understand this resistance. We have normal passports right everybody who wants to travel has a passport they don't raise hell about that we have a vaccination record from the time we're born which is essentially our vaccine passport we've never raised hell about that so why are we raising hell about this new virus which is really as seven million we are over seven million now infections right we should be a young people having long covid the numbers are rising I do not understand. It's a piece of paper that tells people you've had your vaccination. Well, the argument goes that we're not a nation that likes to be asked to show our papers. Oh, my God. Oh, really? We show our papers all the time. It, with what? Mm. what? What do we show? Where do we, we show? Go, you go to the National Health Service. They ask you for an identity, you know, your yeah, identity. You have, yes, if, if you first have, time if you, you register. If you haven't well, got it, they don't really no. care. No, no, I've, I've no it's changed a lot. It's changed a lot. So if you go and you want to register with a new GP... But that's fine yeah. if you're registering, but other than that, you, you don't have no, to show any No, no. In hospitals, even now, because there's been all this panic about the deserving and undeserving migrant using our National Health Service, increasingly, people are asked for evidence. We are constantly being asked to provide this uh, credit card, uh, uh, some kind of identification, our driving licenses. Why resistance about something that is a killer of so many people? I simply do not... Because I think this is why it's the imposition of telling people to take the vaccine. That's the difference. People were told to put seat belts on not that long ago, actually. You know, within my... Not quite my life, but I was very young then. Okay? There was the same hoo-ha 
Barbara Castle, the MP, the Labour MP who brought it <coughs> in. Oh, this is a free country. How dare you tell us what to do? Hang Smoking bans were the Margaret, same. Margaret Smoking bans were the same. They yes, kicked I off about. It, was. it wasn't Barbara Castle. It was Margaret Thatcher. Oh no, it was not. I, I can tell you, it was. Seatbelts. I can tell it's you. It's in my book. No, well, you got your books wrong. No, right? no, I can tell now you. We're I, I know that. I know this because my twentieth birthday in nineteen eighty-two, I hit a transit van head-on at fifty miles an hour without wearing a safety belt. And I remember that, and it was the next year. All right, that I'm going in. to send you my proof, and you send me yours. Well, I haven't got a proof. I've just given you my No, proof. no, no. I've got the <laughs> proof. Experience. It's in my, ba- in oh, I see my what book. You mean. Yeah. Okay, well, we'll, okay. we'll battle but, this one out. Or, or smoking. We've accepted fact, the smoking ban. Wikipedia will know, won't it? Ooh. Chad, Chad yes. while you give your answer, yeah. I'm going to look it up. Seatbelt. Sure. Um, oh. No, I think I, I agree with Amber here. Uh, I think the cases are somewhat encouraging. Um, We've taken far too much of people's freedoms over the last 18, more than 18 months. And um, we, we live in a free country. And I mean, I, honestly, I'm someone who've, who's come from one of the most war-torn um, a- anarchy sort of states um, that when we came to the UK, the fact that we didn't have to show papers as, as Yasmin states. Um, I've never, I think the difference between the, U, uh, the, the UK and so many others, even the US, that, you know, that, that, that it's much more, it's you know you live more comfortably without any imposition or being told how to live or what to say or where to go and i'd like to live continuously in that way but if you think about it when you go to a restaurant today you're having you're having to give your contact details so this is an extension of that and one of the things that we really need to take care of is what do people care about they care about the backlog in the national health we need to protect the national health if we can take reasonable actions that stop the rise in hospitalizations then we should do it it's not about limiting people's freedoms it's about making sure that we're protecting people no i agree with that but there are are alternative there are alternative ways of doing that and uh there are, there are consequences to the process of having vaccine passports. There are consequences to businesses, there are consequences to people's lives. It's a big deal making people have them. So I, I don't think we should enter into it without the real evidence there that it's the right thing we should be able to do because it feels like people are not catching it when they go to big events if they are careful. But and we just had the Cornwall figures come back. 50,000 people got it. Yes. And after a festival, it just happened. No, that wasn't just the festival. I mean, that's, you know, there's all, there have we been had it, all We had it from the European, cha- we had it from the European Championships. The European Championships yes, was yes, a big Yes, yes, but that was a long us. time ago. Right. That means I, was, I have the seatbelt answer here. Okay, um, seatbelt. <laughs> it had been compulsory to fit front seat belts in cars built in Europe since 1965. So I think that's what you're thinking ah. of. But in the Transport Act 1981, they were made compulsory to wear. So you right. could, I think I'm 75% right, and you're 25% right. 50-50? We... Can we go 50-50? No. You're both right. <laughs> you're both right. That's not going to happen. Um, Luke, very quick response from you. Well, I'm very pro-freedom, pro-freedom uh, movement. I think most people are, actually. And I don't see why we should uh, introduce something that's just not needed. Look, if you want to protect yourself, protect yourself. If you don't, then you're free. Uh, just let's be careful, I think, everybody. OK, Luke, thank you. Uh, final question from Anthony in Staines. Anthony, what would you like to ask? Yes, hi, everybody. Uh, which current politician would the panel most like to share a taxi with? <laughs> Um, I think this is aimed at you, Amber, given <laughs> given your remarks about Boris Johnson in the Brexit debate. My remarks were that I didn't want to share a taxi with him at the end of the party because yeah. I didn't think he was necessarily going to be the most responsible person at the party to get me home. But if you're asking me now who I'd share a taxi with, say, in the middle of the day, Boris Johnson. I have some advice for him on lots Do of you? matters. <laughs> yes. So only in the middle of the day, though. I, I, <laughs> we'll draw a lot of conclusions from that. Ian? I'm also going to say Boris Johnson because I'm hoping that I'll get an answer to the questions that I ask at Prime Minister's questions that I never get an answer for. Does it really irritate you when he keeps saying the Scottish Nationalist Party? No, not really. I mean, I know what he's what he's trying to do. Um, I think it offends other people. I think the thing about Boris is he needs to respect other governments in particular. And I think one of the things I do grieve for is that the relationships between all the devolved administrations and the government in London is poor. And that's a matter of choice from number 10. It's not shared by a lot of cabinet ministers, I I hasten to add. But I, I don't like the fact that we find it very difficult. I mean, I've said today that I wanted to see a four-nation uh, agreement on dealing with refugees. It was promised a couple of weeks ago. It hasn't happened. COP26 is coming up. We need to How be able to... How does this question get us onto refugees in COP26? <laughs> I don't know. Shab- Shabnam. 
Um, I think Dominic Rupp. I think I'd like I'd like to have an honest conversation about Afghanistan with him. I think Ben Wallace has been quite vocal, but I I'm yet to hear a, a really you know solid response to what's happened on Afghanistan I from mean, him. So you I think are director of Conservative Friends of Afghanistan. Has he not been on the phone to you? Absolutely not. Not yet. No. Which is the, and then also a failure of consulting with, <gasps> so you need, with the people. He needs a new special advisor. <laughs> he sure does. Yes. I'd love to see that conversation yeah, take I would place. Too. So looking to maybe, the future. Maybe on a sun lounger somewhere. <laughs> Very naughty. Maybe in the studio. Maybe we'll try and set that up. Yasmin. I would like. Uh, I'd really like to get to know Angela Rayner. I think, I really think she's amazing. Even you would struggle to get a word in edgeways. It doesn't matter. I'd like to listen to her. I think I have a thing about her. Oh, dear. All kinds of things about her. I oh, really? love the way she speaks. <laughs> she is everything. And I wish she was the leader of the Labour Party. That's oh, the my goodness, what have you done now? That's the viral clip <laughs> that LBC will be putting out as a result Excellent. of this programme, I think. <laughs> Yasmin Alibaya Brown. No, I better not. Uh, thank, <laughs> thank you very much indeed, all of you, for joining us on Cross Question. Ian Blackford, Amber Rudd, Shabnam Nasimi, and Yasmin Alibaya Brown. In a moment, we're going to ask Are you ashamed of your country? Hilary Mantel, the famous best selling novelist, is, and she's leaving. Don't slam the door behind you, love. It's one minute past nine. On your radio, on Global Player, and. Play LBC. Leading Britain's conversation. This is LBC. From Global's newsroom, the NHS in England will receive an extra £5.4 billion over the next six months. The government says the funding will help hospitals respond to COVID-19.